This isn't to say that the African American community is naive about the fact that African American young men uh, are disproportionately involved in the criminal justice system, uh, that they're disproportionately both victims and perpetrators of violence. Um, it's not to make excuses for that fact, uh, although black folks do interpret uh, the reasons for that in a historical context. They understand that some of the violence that takes place in poor black neighborhoods around the country uh, is born out of uh, a very violent past in this country. That was President Obama on Friday explaining that in African-American communities, we are well aware that much of the violence experienced by African-American men comes at the hands of other black men. But he went on to point out that some of that violence is the result of the country's difficult and violent history. The president was perhaps responding to claims that those who, uh, who expressed frustration over the not guilty verdict in the George Zimmerman trial were not sufficiently outraged by the everyday murders of African-Americans by African-Americans. Um, what do you make, not so much of the president here, but of the critique somehow that our outrage over the Zimmerman verdict meant that we didn't care that Hydea Pendleton, for example, had been killed or, or, or other young African-Americans? Um, one of the things that I think causes all of this, it's, it's kind of the root of uh, all of this kind of turmoil on this stuff, is the idea, and particularly with uh, Barack Obama, that suddenly we need to be a colorblind nation. That Barack Obama, since he's been elected, now everything's colorblind. And I think the idea of colorblindness separates us even more. Even in this trial, when we're talking about it, we won't talk about racial profiling, we won't talk about this, we won't talk about that, when race was the elephant in the room. And I think as long as we keep striving to be colorblind, mm. I'm a black man. Yeah. When you look at me, I'm a black man. He's a white man. When you look at him, he's a white man. And I, colorblindness says to me that you're going to treat me like a white person. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I don't need or want that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I want to, I, all I need to be treated is like the black, Asian, Native American veteran yeah. mutt that I am. Right, well, right, right. That, uh, I, so I, I want to ask you a little bit of, about this, Tim. So we went back because it occurs to me that um, this is not the first president to talk about race and to talk about it personally. Mm -hmm. So we went back and look at LBJ when he was um, uh, trying to pass civil rights legislation. And as he spoke about it, he says, as a man whose roots go deeply into southern soil, I know how agonizing racial feelings are. So planting himself there. Then we, we took a look at Bill Clinton, also a southern white man, who also in his conversations about race in 1997, when he called for a conversation on race, said, but back home, I went to segregated schools, swam in segregated public pools, sat in all white sections at the movies. He went on to say, and traveled through small towns in my state that still marked restrooms and water fountains white and colored. And then the final one, the one that really tripped me out, this was, um, this was President Carter, was asked during a town hall, if you fell in love with a colored woman, would you be willing to marry her? And he says, as far as intermarriages are concerned, I've never been in love with any um, woman other than my wife, but I would hope that in the true spirit of equality and in an absence of racial prejudice, that I would not let the color of a woman's skin interfere with my love for her if I felt that way. And marriage, of course, would be part of the relationship if the circumstances should permit. So, I mean, we have at least three presidents, all right. of them Southern white men, right. who all spoke about race right. in this personal but way. But only uh, in this but, country for a lot of white folks, only when people of color speak about that issue are they divisive. Now, if so if a black man speaks to black truth, um, then that's divisive. If white folks mm -hmm. deny black truth, mm -hmm. that's uniting. And yes. this whole deflection yes. to black on black crime, yes. first of all, we shouldn't call it that That's because right. we don't call white on white crime that even though it's two and a half times more prevalent numerically. Yes. So until we racialize what white folks do to each other, right. then we need to stop doing that with yeah, regard what's wrong to what with your people. Why don't y'all just and, be and, white and, on white? And, and finally, you know, to, to, to bash civil rights folks mm -hmm. for not sufficiently in their mind, because in fact, they do talk about these mm -hmm. issues, but not sufficiently talking about violence in black urban communities is like blaming mothers against drunk driving for not having an adequate campaign to deal with 
with folks who die on the road from not wearing seat belts. Right. right? They're both good issues. More people die from not wearing a seat belt than drunk driving, but that doesn't mean it isn't legitimate to deal with drunk driving. This is a classic deflection technique right. by people who do not want to deal with the reality of racism, have never right. wanted to deal with the reality of racism, and resent the fact that the targets of racism insist that we continue to deal with it. Yeah, like right. I mean, I mean and, and Tim is absolutely correct on this. We come from a place and a space in this country. We need to acknowledge it and do something about it. And this goes beyond conversation. We need policies. I mean, disproportionately, African-American men, for example, have the highest unemployment rate. Did they create that unemployment rate? You know, I, I haven't met any child, whether they be black or white, but we're talking about black children right now who say, and especially black boys who say, when I grow up, I want to go to prison. Right. I'm looking forward to right, that. Right. I want that to be my experience. I want to be racially profiled. Yeah. You know, my husband was a former police officer, and he talked to me coming home from work about ladies clicking their doors. Yeah. Or Now, this is a law enforcement officer that, if you needed help, would be there to help you. But because of his skin color, you automatically assume that he is somehow a criminal yeah. from birth, African-American People, children, male and female, particularly males, they carry that burden every yep. single day. We have got to do something about that I, in this country. You know, I, you, your, your point here is so key. And I'm thinking about the president in that moment saying we've got to wring bias out of ourselves. Yes. And, and also your point about, about colorblindness. And we've just been, we're just in the midst of this amazing moment around LGBT issues, right? Yes. This amazing yes. moment when we are seeing for the first time our friends and exactly. our loved ones who are gay and lesbian. And we are beginning to change policies yep. around, like, mm-hmm. And it, and it is one of the most extraordinary stories of this epic of American history. Yes. And, and that we could at the same time be beginning, just beginning, mm-hmm. to do the work of recognition mm-hmm. there. And then failing, continuing to fail on the recognition on the other side. No one wants blindness, right? The whole point is to see, not yes. to be blind. That's Thank right. you to Val Nichols. Um, and I want to let viewers know that they can read your full column right now online at msnbc.com. Up next, we've got more, but we're going to switch gears a little bit. As activists prepare to hold vigils in 100 cities around the country today, President Obama says it is time to take a stand on Stand Your Ground. Mm -hmm. 